Uh, if you'd like to, you can go ahead and turn your Bibles to Romans 12th chapter. That'll be the first place that we'll be going, talking about some things from the Scriptures at that particular place. I want to go ahead and mention, while we have our uh, few minutes together here to start with, I came here to work. It is my intention to do whatever it is that I can to be helpful to the church during this week. Now, if you've got somebody that you think would be particularly helpful for us to go see together uh, during the time that I'm here, it could be before services or after services in the morning or at lunchtime or whatever it is, if you've got some idea of something that we could do together that might be helpful to somebody, I want you to let me know about that. Or somebody who's fallen away or somebody that you'd like to start studies with or somebody you'd like particularly to come, if you think a visit with them, would be helpful, then let me know. If there's anything like that I can do, if there's something I can do to help you or study with you uh, at any of the times that I'm here, I will um, gladly leave Bill's company and uh, sit down and talk with you all for a few minutes. But you know, the reason Bill's being nice is because he knows I get to talk for longer every night than he does. And he just, you got to be careful when you talk about people who can really talk a long time. Okay, great to be with you. I want to ask you a question. Why are we here today? <coughs> sure, let's get an answer. What, what is it we've come here to do today? God. Yeah, we're worshiping. And we're using the Word of God as an impetus, as something to kind of launch us into that. Isn't that right? So the view that we take of what we're doing here and what it is that is at the center of all of that should have a massive impact on our lives. Isn't that right? So what is it that we're really looking for? Comfort? Are we looking just for eternity? Are we looking to be told what to fix? Whoops! <laughs> we're going to go right into meddling. Is that, is that what we're going to do today? Yeah, that's exactly my intention. I believe something, and this lesson that we're going to be talking about this morning emphasizes this belief very strongly. I don't believe that the Word of God was given to inform us simply. I believe the Word of God was given to change us entirely. And little by little, that's exactly what we need to have as an intention when we come into a Bible class, when we come to worship. I expect to be changed by that. I'm coming with that mindset. It's very easy for us to sit in a, in a group of people like this, especially if you know each other very well, and think, oh, that was a really good lesson for her to hear. That was a really good lesson for him to hear. Oh, oh the young people really needed that one. Or, uh, oh, I hope all the men in the congregation were listening to that one. Or I hope everybody who's not as good as me was listening to that one. It's very easy for us to kind of fall into a mentality like that, but what is it that I've come here for today? Have I come here just to be a great example for all of the weak people who are around me? See, that's the wrong attitude for us to take. And then on the other hand, you have people who are just kind of part-timing it. And I know in every congregation, every congregation, there are pew potatoes. People who are just kind of taking up space and just kind of lumps on logs and they don't really accomplish much. And this is what they're looking for. One author put it like this. I'd like to buy... Well, here we go. 42. I would like to buy $5 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep. Just enough to equal a warm cup of milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of Him to make me love minorities or serve lowly people or talk to homeless people. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I'd like to buy $5 worth of God, please. But the real deal is something uh, that the Scriptures talk to us about is transformation. Does this thing work? <laughs> Part of it works. There, there it is. Thank you. This is what we really need to be looking for. It's transformation. So let's turn to Romans 12. And let's read this passage. And I'd like for you to try to do something that can be difficult when you're good Bible students. And I've heard you guys are great Bible students. This is difficult. I'm going to ask you to try this. I want you to try to read this like you've never, ever heard it before. I want you to try to imagine you've never read this before, but you have the idea that the Scriptures are important. Okay, can we try that? So let's look at this. Romans 12, beginning in verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, 
acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service or spiritual service of worship, some versions read. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All over the Scriptures, especially the New Testament, it is God's intention to take us from one thing into another thing. Isn't that true? He wants us to become the new man and put away the old man. Colossians 3. Jesus says, you've got to be born again to Nicodemus in John the third chapter. Isn't that right? We're looking to become these completely new people. If any man is in Christ, he is what? New creation. He's not the same old person that he once was. In 1 Peter 2, in verse 2, he says, I want you to desire the pure milk of the Word that you may, as if you were babies. As if you just didn't know it. And so that's the attitude we need to have. I just don't know it. Ooh, Socrates originally said, He who knows that he does not know it is he who truly knows. When we take the attitude that we just don't know everything and I'm going to learn something new and I'm going to do that every time I crack open the Bible, I need God to do something to me. I need something to change within me. But we've got a problem because in our world, this idea of being transformed, the admission, the admission of need, the admission of incompleteness, that is completely against everything that we've learned in our culture. We're supposed to look like we've got it all together. You, never a hair out of place. Never a wrong step. Uh, always, uh, you misunderstood me. If I said something that was wrong, instead of, my, instead of saying, um, I was wrong. Excuse me. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. We're quick to say things like, well, you misunderstood me. or You didn't understand my intention. Or you didn't hear me the right way. or uh, It's always on somebody else. But people who are being transformed can easily say, you know what? I, I misspoke. I, I shouldn't have said that. I spoke too quickly. Please forgive me. Overlook that. But in our world, the image is everything. Substance is meaningless. What something actually is doesn't have any difference. Well, this is the exact opposite thing to what God's talking about. The substance is the only thing that matters. The image of it really doesn't make any difference. What does it look like? Well, look. Who cares what it looks like? What is it? That's what we've got to be focused on. And so these ideas that we read about transformation, don't be conformed to this world. And why does he have to say that? Why does he have to say, don't be conformed to this world? Yes, sir. Because if you're conformed to this world, the transformation is going to take place. That's right. You've settled for the second place prize. Not even second place, probably. You're settling for something that's inferior. It's not what you were made to be. But why does he have to caution us against that? It's easy. So easy. What does the world want? The world says, you are walking out of step. All this business of you and your own drummer, you can forget that. You need to fall lockstep with us. You need to get right in with what's going on. We don't like you looking different, sounding different, being different, acting different. We don't like that. Just get with the program or you'll be ostracized. You'll be marginalized. You'll be sidelined. You will be a second class citizen. You won't get promotions. You won't get raises. You won't have friends. There will be nothing for you in this world. You better learn to play the game. Or you're going to lose it. And so the pressure to get into their mold and do whatever it is they say is very high. And he says, for that reason, you must resist that. You cannot take your cues from the world. You've got to take your cues from God. And this is a problem. Instead of being caterpillars, which is what we ought to be, we've learned to be something else. One author said this. I love this statement about caterpillars. He says, The caterpillar is the most confused creature which roams the planet because undoubtedly stamped in his soul is the call to fly. You know, here he's crawling around and he just, you know, he just that, like the caterpillars do. And inside him he knows, man, I'm supposed to be out here with the birds and flitting and fluttering everywhere. And I'm kind of bound to this. Well, what is the problem? Well, inside him is this call. 
Inside him is the nature that God placed within him to be something different than what he is. So he's confused about things. That's us. We're in this world and we're surrounded by these things. And we know we're made for something more. And you can see it in the people all around you. You can see them calling out that the nature within them, the eternal nature within them, is calling out for something greater, more existence, more abundant life than what they're living. And they're trying to fill this God-shaped hole in the middle of them with alcohol and drugs and illicit sex and prominence and fame and all of those things. Money and stuff. And they just don't understand. They've got the American dream. They've got the 2.3 kids, the dog and the cat, and the two cars, and the garage to hold them in the house. And they've got the money and the 401k, and they've got all of that stuff, and they still look at their lives and they say, is this all there is? And Jesus is talking to us. He says, what would a man give for his soul? If a man would give all that he had, to obtain the world, what does he have if he loses his soul? And in this world that you and I are living in, we're not even going for the world. We're looking for middle class. We're willing to sacrifice our souls just to be middle class people. What happens is we are tempted. Instead of being caterpillars, we've learned to be chameleons. We blend right in no matter what's going on. And we justify that sometimes by saying things like, well, I know how I really feel. I know what's really in my heart. I know what's really going on inside me. They're going to tell the dirty jokes and they're going to do all this other stuff. They're going to be their way. And I'm not going to laugh. I'm not going to, I'm not going to walk away. I'm not, certainly not going to say anything. I'm not going to cause trouble. I'm not going to rock the boat. I'm not going to mess things up. But I know who I am inside. And I want you, to, want you to be honest and objective about this and tell me what the people around you are seeing. Do they see someone who blends in just like they do? Or do they see someone who is awkwardly in the shape of the caterpillar and looks like they're trying to become a butterfly? What is it that they see? So let's turn back here again to uh, Romans 12. We're going to look at that. While uh, you're looking at that, I want you to just listen to Hebrews 4 very quickly. You Feel free to turn. Put your finger in Romans 12. We'll come back to that. Hebrews 4, verse 11. I want you to see something he says about the agent of transformation. What the Bible can actually accomplish. Beginning here in Hebrews 4th chapter, verse 11, Let us therefore be diligent in that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. That is the agent. That is the thing when applied makes things happen. Now that's very important. What the Bible can do versus what the Bible is actually doing is dependent on one variable. What is that? And why is that? Why is that a variable? It certainly is. I can read Passages about fornication and lust and lasciviousness. And I can be convicted by that and say, you know, I don't need to look at pornography and I don't need to lust after other people and I I need to keep myself faithful. I can do all of that and the Word of God will do that because of my heart. But somebody who's an atheist can read that same word and think that's a joke. And they'll chuckle. Look at these antiquated ideas. These cute people with their mythology. All of these ridiculous notions that you can't just have sex with whomever you want to. Oh, there's something wrong with pornography. Come on. You people. You see what I'm saying? The one thing that makes all the difference is the heart of the person who's absorbing it. What the Bible can do is change you. But you have to be willing to let it. 
Romans 12, once more. Here he says, I want you to let it change you. Here in Romans, the 12th chapter, um, when he's talking about this, present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, a reasonable service. When he says that in verse 2 here, that you're not to be conformed to this word, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, there is a certain tense in which that's being used that requires your cooperation. That the Holy Spirit can change you, can renew your mind, but you have to be involved in that. It's not a magic wand. I cannot put the Bible under my pillow and absorb it through osmosis. I cannot just own one and all of a sudden I'm a better person as a result of it. I have to absorb it with the intention of application. Listen, there is a problem in the church nationwide. There are an awful lot of people who know an awful lot of things about what the Scriptures teach and it's not doing anything. Until you use it for the purpose of application, living it, it didn't matter what you studied. Once in a while, I know this sounds radical, once in a while, we probably should have a Bible class where instead of trying to learn something new and diligently studying to learn something we've not ever learned before, we should spend a quarter or six months or a year just learning how to do the stuff we already know how to do. That's really what we got to be doing. And this is where it comes down, verse 1, where he says, living sacrifices. So, here we go. Living is the Greek word zao, which is where we get the word zoo from. We love the zoo. We've got a great zoo in Louisville. Uh, we've enjoyed going. We're very sad, actually, that our kids are kind of too old. They don't really want to go to the zoo anymore. My wife and I are very sad because we still want to go to the zoo. And uh, we'll get the guts to just get our own passes and go without our kids. I think we will. But so far, you know, we're just like, oh, you don't want to go to the zoo. We made our son go to the zoo uh, last year with our pass to take some of his senior pictures because we spent so many times at the zoo, it would be inappropriate. And this is his face in some of the pictures. <laughs> We didn't, we didn't take those. Those weren't the ones we used. Okay, so, what do you go to the zoo to see? Okay, there are animals there, right? Well, who said that? I go to see living animals. I don't go to see taxidermized animals. It's not a museum. I want to see some stuff happen. I'm always disappointed when the lions are so lazy. They just sit there and they just... So I make noises at them, and it embarrasses my kids. They used to get really embarrassed. I'd, ooh, ooh, ooh. That's a noise they make in the wild, you know, and sometimes it makes them go, is there one outside the cage? Is there a door that I'm not? <laughs> and one time, I mean, I've done this dozens of times. It zoos all over the Eastern Seaboard. It's so embarrassing for my children. One time, a lion stood up and got on top of that rock and he was just wound up. He did that for like 15 minutes. We just kind of walked away. <laughs> you know, I know the zookeepers are thinking, but I want to see, I want to, I want to see them drop a rabbit in the lion cage and watch that what happens next. You know what I mean? I want to see the living stuff, don't you? I want to see them vibrant. I want to see the bears throwing the barrels and swimming, and I want to see the seals just jumping and playing and clapping and carrying on. I want to see movement. I want to see activity. Living sacrifices tells us just exactly that. God wants us to be exuberant, vivacious, living people that we smile, that we live, that we just milk life for everything that it's got that God provided for us. That we don't come to church like this. How are you doing today? Some people you just learn not to ask that question of, don't you? They may tell you. You walk up to certain people and you say, Hey, you want to go to church with me this week? We're having a gospel meeting. It'll be great. Why don't you come? Oh, they didn't want to come. Are you shocked? Living sacrifices that we are in fact replacing 
Some things. That's the sacrifice part. We are not partaking in some things that the people of the world have by free will the right to do. We do not do those things. And we forbid ourselves and we restrict ourselves and we do things just the way God says to do them. But we do so in a living way with vibrance and happiness and pleasure that we have learned this is really, really, no kidding, the best life possible. And I'm so disgusted with people like Joel Osteen who want to tell you about the best life now. And he says, it's dependent on the fact that if you'll do these things, you'll have all the money and all the houses and all the stuff that you could ever want. You'll never have debt. You'll have any problems. You'll always be happy. You'll be totally healthy. It's the gospel of health and wealth that other people have been preaching for decades. I'm telling you, you can have the best life now, but it is not devoid of issues and problems and trials and issues that you cannot control. You still have those things. What does the Christianity about it make a difference? Your eggs are not all stuck in this basket. That's what the difference is. That things happen to you, but you don't have the same reaction that other people have. Flat tires and bad hair days, you know what? So what? I'm not meant to be here for long anyhow. This is not where I've got all my eggs put, so who cares? That we've sacrificed whatever the world's offering for what God's offering, and we do it in a living way. That we're excited about that. You see, when we cooperate with the Spirit, the changes that happen within us, they can be mild, and they can be slight, and they can be gradual, but they are perpetual, and they are continual. They are of that nature. Does that make sense to everybody? That's exactly what we're looking for. I wish every Christian knew by heart the story of the English Bible. Not even all of the issues of textual criticism and all the other stuff that goes into um, understanding the translation of the Bible from original language, but just the English. If you just knew the story of how we got the English Bible, you would take your Bible in hand and you would hold it like it was a beloved and cherished heirloom all the time. Because I'm not kidding or exaggerating when I say literally hundreds of people died to put the Bible in your hands in a language that you can understand. They fought the biggest establishment in the history of the world to make that happen. That was the Catholic Church at the time who forbade the translation of the Scriptures into common tongues like English. It's so easily accessible. It's so readily available. And a lot of times what happens is we close it on Sunday night after services. We pick it up Wednesday on the way to Bible class. We open it there for about an hour. And we close it. And it won't open again until Sunday morning when we sit in these pews. Shameful is what that is. We have the answers to every issue and problem known to humankind. And the fact that we're not well versed in those things well enough to live by them and advise and counsel others how to do the same is shameful. To be all the information that God wanted all people to know for all time, it's not really a very big book. Now, it's a big book in some senses. The last Harry Potter book is much thicker. And I read all of those. But this, real estate-wise, is not a very big book. And it is ours. It's our heritage. This is, it belongs to us. We don't have to ask permission to read it. We don't have to ask permission to buy a new copy if we want a new copy of it. We can get a big print one as we get older, and I mean, may need it. We can get different translations of it. We can love some of them and not like the others. But the point is, I could have literally thousands of copies of it, and as an American, that's totally okay. And there are people in China who are reading Bibles that got smuggled in. We ought to be ashamed. 
It's the agent of transformation. If we want the life that God wants us to have, we've got to get it in our hands. What does Isaiah 55 verses 10 and 11 tell us about the Word of God? He likens it to atmospheric phenomenon. What's he call it? What's going on in Isaiah 55 verses 10 and 11? Rain, snow. What falls from the heavens? What's the point of rain? Why does that happen? Nourishment. Nourishment. It takes care of the earth, the crops, plants, the people, the animals. Rain is good, correct? So does it accomplish the purpose that God created it for? Sure it does. And what does He say about the Word of God? It's exactly like the rain. It will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. It will not return to me void. We all know what void means. We don't hardly write any checks anymore. But the word void used to mean a lot when you had checks, you know. This is not good anymore. This is pointless. This is futile. It does not work for the purpose that it appears to work for. That's what void meant, right? He says the Word of God never returns void. Let me tell you why that is. Because no matter what happens afterward, when it gets in the ears of people, it's accomplished what it was sent to do. Because it will drive people into the Lord or away from Him. And it's based on their heart. Strictly based on their heart as to what, what of those two reactions you get. When the Word is preached, it changes good people. Now if the Word is preached and it offends you and bugs you and bothers you, there was an old preacher from Alabama that I grew up listening to all the time. My favorite phrase he ever used was the hit dog howls. Y'all heard that? Listen to me talking to you all. I called you all y'all. Maybe you've never heard that. The hit dog house. Well, when I was a kid growing up, we'd have just packs of dogs would kind of run together like gangs in our neighborhood. They were usually harmless, but they run together like they were buddies. And they get in the trash. They turn over garbage cans and they'd make messes and they get in people's flower beds and just So once in a while my dad would go out there and he'd see a bunch of dogs getting in the garbage and he'd take a brick and he'd hurl that brick in that pack. One dog would make a noise. Do you know which one? The one that got hit. The hit dog howls. So, Brother Bill's up here, or I'm up here this week. I'm going to be pitching bricks. And if you feel it, ah! You come up to me and tell you something, buddy, about this. The first thing I'm going to think is, the hit dog howls. You're welcome. That's what I'm going to think. Because the Word of God accomplishes what it does. And you know what? That makes me feel good. If it makes you angry, if it gets to you like that, you're reachable. The people that you throw that brick out there and they just go, hmm. boy, I can't do much with that. Good people are changed by it. They're affected by it. And people who are determined to sell themselves to do wickedness, they're completely turned off by it. And they stake their claim and they say, God has no place here in my life. You know what that does? That sets the ground for judgment. It's already been determined. You get to decide. How will I be judged? How did you react to the Word? The Word of God accomplishes the purpose for which it's sent. Every single time. It's got that kind of power. Well, the Thessalonians, when Paul writes to them, he's very impressed with them. First book that he writes to them. When they heard the Word of God, how did they accept it? Do you remember that? They received it in what way? Yes, sir. That's right. Not as the word of men, but as he says, as it is in truth, the word of God. Do you believe 
that the Bible is the Word of God? Now that's the simplest question you're going to hear anybody ask in a long time. That's a yes or no answer, isn't it? Do you believe that the Bible is the verbally inspired Word of God? The Grover Stevens just said, this is yes and this is no. It's Bible class. You can say yes and no if you want. You believe it? Yes. 100%. Is there any of it that's missing? No. We got all of it? Yes. That's right. Is there anything in it that shouldn't be in there? We got any extras? No. Okay. Well, you shouldn't have been so quick to answer. Because now we've convicted ourselves 100%. We don't have, we don't have a place to go now. Let's forget all this silly foolishness about being a good moral book about being a nice moral standard. Let's just take C.S. Lewis's standpoint. Okay, Jesus, He is either Lord, or He's a liar, or He's a lunatic. I wouldn't follow a lunatic anywhere, would you? Now, my wife does once in a while. She goes with me all kinds of places. <laughs> but, you know, that's her judgment. She's imperfect. If He's a liar, does He deserve anything from you? I hate liars. I hate lying. I despise it. I absolutely, it just disgusts me. It's the corruption of the one singular powerful thing that can change people's lives, which is the truth. So if Jesus is the Lord and His book is the book of God and it comes from Him, then we owe it 100% allegiance. It owns us. There is governance within it. I must never step out of uh, out of step with the Scriptures. Even if that means I step completely out of step with my society. And your society, friends, is marching 180 degrees away from God. And it is happening at a much quicker rate than it was happening just a little while ago. Two weeks ago, the mayor of Houston, Texas, demanded the sermon outlines of all the preachers in the city. She is a lesbian, and what she's looking for is hate speech. Listen, I, at this point in my life, I'm 42. I fully expect, and I'm not kidding, I'm not exaggerating, I'm not making a joke. I fully expect to spend some time in jail before I'm dead. The direction things are going in. And you know what? That's fine with me. Better men than me have gone to jail for the same reasons. I'd be happy to do that. Because I'm not going to change. I'm not going to deviate from the path upon which Jesus has set me. That path, I know where it leads. And my society is so fickle, it will change again before you know it. If the world stands long enough, we'll swing right back around to super conservative ideals. It, it happens all the time. So what am I going to do? I'm going to stick with the winning team. I'm going to stick with the authoritative source. And listen, if I can sit in assemblies like these, if I can go to Bible classes like these and sit there and remain unchanged year after year and decade after decade, there's something grievously wrong with my character. And I must correct that. If, I, if I'm to see God, I must correct that. So let me just run through very quickly what kind of changes we can expect to see. And I want to, set the, I want to use this to set up the rest of the time we have together this week, okay? All right? Because I only got, I think I've got five minutes left. I think when Bill finished making announcements, we had 20 minutes for class. <laughs> it's going to cause these kinds of changes. When Paul talks to Timothy about the Old Testament Scriptures in which he was raised up, because they contain the story of the Christ and the prophecies and the promises of God, it says, from child you've known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He was primed to accept Jesus by those Scriptures. You understand that? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, in, uh, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you believe that? I believe the Word of God saves lost people. Raise your hand if you believe that. I believe it converts wicked people to righteous people. You believe that? Well, then what's to stop me from telling everybody I know about it? 
There's a preacher down in Madison, Indiana. His name's Gary Sandusky. Is anybody familiar with Gary? One of the best human beings I've ever known. I mean, I love his preaching. I mean, he's not really what you'd call articulate, but he's super dynamic. I love it. There's a lady who tells him every time she sees him, when I pull up to a stoplight and a big old boy rolls up on a Harley, he's sitting there, tattoos all the way up, and he's got long hair. He may have a bottle of Jack Daniels sticking out the saddlebag on the side, and he just looks rough. What most of us do is what? Looking for the window button. Looking for that door lock. Okay? Clunk. And if he hears that noise, clunk, and looks over at us, we're like, oh, what was that noise? <laughs> she says, because of Gary, because of Gary's background, because of what Gary used to be, everything, everything inside her changed when she met him. She rolls her window down and she leans out and hollers loud enough that she thinks this guy can hear, Hey, would you like to go to church with me? Because she thinks that guy might be a gospel preacher someday. Listen, if the Apostle Paul, whose main mission in life was to eradicate Christianity, if he can become the greatest proponent of Christianity, who among us could not become faithful? It is not our job to inspect the soil. It's our job to spread the seed. Amen. Friend uh, David White, who's a Texan, he used to say that, and my son used to do an imitation of him. He'd come out of Bible class and he said, David White told us today, we're not supposed to be soil inspectors, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be seed sowers. And he said, I didn't understand what he said, Dad. We're from Kentucky. You imagine can't understand what somebody's saying because you're from Kentucky? Soul inspectors. And Matthew said, so you mean like the inside of us, the part of us that's eternal, the soul, or like the shoe? What do you mean? What are you talking? He goes, no, soul, you know, dirt. He said, you mean soil? He said, that's what I said, soul. <laughs> we're not soul inspectors, we're seed throwers. That's what we do. I believe the Word of God can change people. Can it convert them? Is there anybody it can't convert? No. It just takes a change of heart. It makes us holy. It is the Word of God in truth. John the 17th chapter, verse 17. He says in his prayer to God, Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. I think the Word of God can sanctify us. It can make us holy people. No matter what we used to be, it can change us. Can it not? I read an interesting article not long ago called Sexual Atheism. That there's a whole group of people in the millennials crowd that they come to church and they do that regularly and they give their money to the church and they are involved even in Bible classes and special ministries and all kinds of stuff. But when it comes to sex, they're atheists because they still live with their boyfriends and girlfriends and they still have premarital sex and they still carry on like that. That, my friends, is purely societal impact. That's all in the world that is. It's exposure and desensitization, and that's what we've gotten. That's where we're at. I believe the Word, if you let it affect you, it bugs you if you do stuff like that. It bothers you if you get involved in things like that. It hurts your heart if you get into things like that, and you know you need to change, and what you've got to do is change. And if you can't change by yourself, James 5.16 tells us, you need to confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Get whatever help you've got to get in order to get the change you need. Does that make sense? Because it's able to do that. It can sanctify us. And it keeps us disciples. That passage we love so much in verse 32 of John 8. That you shall know the truth and the truth, is, <laughs> and the truth shall set you free. Verse 31, Jesus said to the Jews who believed Him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Then he says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If you don't want to follow Jesus, there are only two possibilities. You don't know him, or you don't understand him. All of our Bible study should make us expert on the person of Jesus. And if you still don't want to follow Jesus afterward, you miss something. 
Because His Word will make you a disciple, a follower, a learner of Him, a lifelong student of Jesus. And just about the time you think you've got it figured out, you read a passage you read five years ago and you go, oh, I never noticed that before. Because the agent of change is living and powerful and accomplish those things that God sends it to be. And it's also able to build us up. When Paul's talking to those Ephesian elders in Acts the 20th chapter, the very last thing he says here is, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I believe the word of God can make us stronger, make us better. I believe it has everything the church needs to make it the church God wants it to be. Let me share one last phrase with you and I'll let this class be yours. I want you to commit this to your memory even though it's not a Bible verse. And I think you can do it. God's things done in God's ways will never lack God's support. And if that's the attitude we take, brethren, there's nothing we can't do that He tells us we can and there's nothing this church can't be that God says it can be. Really looking forward to our time together. Thank you so much for your good patience, your listening, your comments. Thank you.